let's get back into the swing of things today. I'm very excited to uh, bring on uh, a, a friend of mine who is, you know, frankly, my favorite um, child preacher turned Harvard theologian turned uh, researcher at Rice University. Dr. Anthony Penn is going to talk about if Jay-Z and Richard Dawkins were friends. Um, I think this is an awesome way of bringing intersectionality to this conference because I am curious to know, well, what would happen if that indeed were the case? So, um, Dr. Penn, come on up and uh, let's, bring, let's bring ourselves to a nice round of applause for Dr. Anthony Penn. This is going to be a good one, folks. <laughs> Good morning. This is my third day in and out of this room, so I know you can do better than that. I've heard you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so happy to be with you uh, today. I'm a, an atheist who takes seriously theology. In fact, I refuse to let my colleagues deny me the opportunity to understand myself as a theologian. That's what I am, it's what I do, but I'm also an atheist. I'm a 50-year-old male who is very proud of his AARP card. You laugh, but next time you see me in the theater, don't ask for any of my free popcorn. <laughs> I'm a 50-year-old male, middle class, rather tame, but a die-hard hip-hop fan. For a lot of folks, this would constitute a contradiction. But let me do this. I won't assume that you know very much about me, so let me give you a sense of why I don't see these sorts of combinations as contradictory, but a necessity. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. It's on the other end of the state. Hip-hop develops in New York City. Folks in Buffalo claim that portion of the state as well. Anything that happens in New York and Buffalo, we get credit for it too. It's a short drive. We own it as well, right? That we understand ourselves to have a relationship to New York City, to the city that Staten Island and Long Island don't even have. Right, and they're in close proximity. We claim it. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, on the east side. It's a predominantly African-American section of Buffalo. I'm near Martin Luther King Jr. Park. That says it all, Martin Luther King Jr. Park. My family always valued education. My mother's parents moved from North Carolina to Buffalo looking for economic opportunity. They were both college trained, but in North Carolina, that didn't mean very much. They moved to Buffalo so that their children would have opportunities, would have access, would be able to dream big in a way that they could not. On both sides of my family, Bethlehem Steel was the source of revenue. It was a major opportunity. It marked a type of social and cultural inclusion. It meant just a small slice of the American dream, but a slice that my folks in North Carolina found hard to imagine and my folks in Dinwiddie, Virginia found hard to imagine. I grew up in a fairly religious family, not my father, but everyone else. So going to church, some of my early memories, riding along with my grandfather, his thick glasses on and his deacon outfit on. We made our way to Lackawanna, which is near Bethlehem still, because he was a deacon in a small Baptist church there. So we all went, and as children, we had games that we would play. The thing you didn't want was my grandfather to catch you. All he had to do was give you that look, and you knew that was it. So we play our game. Everyone had a hymnal, and you'd open up the hymnal, and the goal was to land on the same hymn. And if you landed on the same hymn, the first one to recognize it won the game. And that person had the right to be the first person to ask to go to the restroom. And the key to this was this. <laughs> How long can you stay away before your absence is noted? Church was part of my life, but my mother finally decided that this Baptist environment was not the right environment for us. She didn't want her children growing up in a religious environment in which women had less simply because they were women. 
she said we had to move on. So we started going to an independent church that was much closer to our home. That church would eventually affiliate with the African Methodist Episcopal denomination, the oldest black denomination in the country. I remember one Sunday, I hadn't gone with my mother and sister, I'd stayed home with my father, but they came home with news. My mother and my sister had joined the church, and I thought, well, if my sister joined the church, there's nothing she gets to do that I'm not going to do. So the next Sunday, I woke up from my nap, sitting in the pew, we had played our games, and took a little nap, as was my custom, woke up and asked my mother what those folks were doing who walked to the front of the church. And she said they were joining the church and giving themselves to Christ. And I told her, well, I want to do that too. So she smiled a knowing smile and sent me on my way, and I walked to the front of the church and told the church secretary that my name is Anthony Bernard Penn and I wish to join. And I was a part of this family now. I had an extended family in Buffalo, but this church became a part of my family in a very different way. We spent a tremendous amount of time in this church, and one Sunday, the minister, this was a fairly small church, so the minister also taught my Sunday school class. So one Sunday, we're sitting in a circle, and he asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And there were the typical responses, lawyer, doctor, president. He got to me, and I said, preacher. I'm not quite certain why I said it. I'm not quite certain what I anticipated he would do in response, but I said it, and his response was, okay, we start next week. So childhood was over for me at that point. No more the hymnal games, no more delayed trips to the restroom. I was in the pulpit. I lined the hymns. I said the prayers. I opened the doors of the church and invited people to Christian discipleship. I was on my way. I couldn't go to the store alone, and I had to be in the house before the streetlights came on, but I'm leading people to Christ. With time, we got a new minister, and folks told this new minister that Tony has a calling on his life. The Lord has pointed him out. He's going to be a, a great man of God. And he said, well, okay, we'll take it a little slower than other folks have taken it. But with time, while I was still a preteen, I preached my first sermon, my trial sermon. And the real test within my denomination, anyway, wasn't how loud you got, how much you moved around. It was how many people joined the church as a response to what you said. And so that was the real test. And three people came, so I was on my way. That was the beginning for me. I was quickly made one of the youth ministers again. I had to be in the house before the streetlights came on. I couldn't go to the store alone. I couldn't vote. I couldn't drive. But I'm telling people what to do with their lives mapping out lives for them that I couldn't, as a 12-year-old and a 13-year-old and 14-year-old, could not imagine. But this was my life. High school, I was in a gifted program, but my mother and I decided that that was not really the place for us, but that I needed to be pe with people who were like-minded. So I transferred from that school to a small Southern Baptist high school. That was a feeder program for Bob Jones University. You familiar with it? They came twice a year to talk to the students. They didn't spend much time with me, but they talked to all the others. It was a feeder program for Bob Jones University, and I was in it, right? And it was clear within the context of the school that education mattered, but it mattered only to the extent it could be filtered through the truth of the gospel message. Yes, science mattered, but it had to be filtered through the truth of the gospel message. Mathematics mattered, social science mattered, history mattered, philosophy mattered, but only to the extent they could be filtered through the truth of the gospel. So I ate this. It was time for college, and I decided I had to get out of Buffalo. I had good friends in Buffalo, but they lacked ambition, and I needed more than I thought I could get in Buffalo. I thought I would just suffocate in Buffalo. And it turned out that the minister who was in charge of the church was being moved to New York City, and I took this as a sign from the Lord. He's going to New York. I'm going to New York for college. And I, I became a part of this church that was in Brooklyn, New York. It's in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Don't think Bedford-Stuyvesant in 2015 right, where a dilapidated brownstone will cost you half a million. Think Bedford-Stuyvesant, 1982, crack cocaine, misery. That was my Bedford-Stuyvesant. And I'm involved in this church, and it reaches a point where I'm just having a difficult time. There's a kind of dissonance that is just racking me. I'm in classes in which the Bible isn't taken seriously. I had professors who had the nerve to argue that the Bible was simply literature. That was not my experience. And they said this without fear. 
I'm thinking you're going to hell for that, and they didn't seem concerned. <laughs> I'm encountering students who don't believe what I believe, right? We didn't have that baseline education, right? They did not believe what I believed. But here was the thing that tripped me out. They often treated me better than folks in the church. They didn't believe what I believed. From my perspective, they were morally and ethically bankrupt, but they treated me better than people in the church. And this was difficult for me. I, I was having a hard time. It reached a point where it was just difficult for me to think about being in the context of that pulpit. So some Sundays, I had to be in church for the 6 o'clock service, but that wasn't, that wasn't difficult for me because I, I thrived on very little sleep, right? That was a badge of courage. I pulled three all-nighters, right? This was a badge of courage. So a little sleep, that really didn't bother me. But there were some Sundays I couldn't do it. I'd get to 116th Street and Broadway, wait for the number one train, and let it pass. And I'd sit down and wait for another to pass, and I'd wait for another to pass. I, I had to time this just right. And I'd probably get on that third train, and I'd make my way to 59th Street and transfer to that famous A train headed to Brooklyn. And I wouldn't get on it when it came. I'd wait. I'd look at my watch, and I'd wait a little longer. And then I'd hop on the train, and I'd make my way to Bedford-Stuyvesant, get off the train, and slowly walk to the church. The goal was this, to get there late enough that I did not have to participate. I wouldn't have to be in the pulpit. I wouldn't have to lead prayer. I wouldn't have to open the doors of the church. I wouldn't have to participate because I was losing my grip on this faith. It didn't seem to make much sense. I'm dealing with young people who are having an easier time thinking about death and their eulogies than they had thinking about a bright and productive future. And I mean this, I, we had an after school program and my attitude was you gotta, you gotta be able to capture ideas with words, that words mean something. We shape worlds with words and you gotta be able to capture ideas. So I tell them, take 15 minutes and you just write. I don't care what you write about, just write. And my thought is, well, they'll write about these new sneakers or boyfriends or girlfriends or this sort of thing. But too many of them wrote about their own demise. And we're doing this in the basement of the church. And I didn't have a damn thing to say that countered that. Mine was a faith that was based upon suffering. It glorified suffering from the moment of the crucifixion moving forward. It glorified suffering. It wasn't uncommon in my context to hear no cross, no crown. Right? We're tried by fire, but we'll come out like pure gold, right? We kind of measured our success in the world based upon the kind of suffering we endured. I had nothing to say to these young people. And my, my ideas about God are being reshaped, rethought, and much of this is taking place within the context of a conversation with a form of cultural expression that I was growing to love, hip-hop. I'm wrestling with this in the context of a world that these artists described in graphic terms. I'm wrestling with this loss of faith, and I'm hearing Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five say, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. It's like a jungle sometimes it makes me want. I'm hearing this. And it spoke a certain type of truth to me. They had a vocabulary and a grammar that was much more robust than my own, and I'm slowly moving away from this church thing. It isn't meeting my needs. I, I'm finding the work of graffiti artists much more compelling than the stained glass windows in my church. I'm finding the movements of breakers who seem to defy gravity and who speak to the supple and beautiful nature of the body much more compelling than the church lady dancing in the spirit. And what rappers and DJs were able to do, manipulating sound and painting words in ways that create a world much more compelling than the hoop of the preacher. And, and I'm just at a loss. I'm still committed to ministry. I'm still going to do this thing. Yeah, I'm still going to do this thing. But my ideas concerning God and Christ and all of these theological categories changing. No longer was mine a God who broke into human history and made things happen. Mine was the kind of God that my grandmother once described to me. It was that still, small voice that attempts us to persuade that attempts, attempts to persuade us to do 
the good, but that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm losing pieces of this faith, but I'm struggling trying to hold on to this. And I'm in conversation with hip hop that's giving me a very different view of the world. It's helping me to com become comfortable with paradox, with uncertainty, with turmoil and complexity. It's helping me to understand these things and giving me a different way to understand myself as a black male living in a world that is often death dealing and doing a better job of it than scripture did. I, I decided I had to get out of the city. I loved New York then and I love it now, but I had to get out of the city. I, I was going to train for ministry, but I needed to be in a place where they would push me to think about things differently. So from everything I'd heard about Harvard, they didn't really care much about God and ministry there. So I figured Harvard Divinity School was the place I would go because they would push me to ask hard questions and this would work for me. This would work for me. So I packed up and I moved to Boston and I started working in a church in Roxbury, not Roxbury 2015, but Roxbury 1986, a different world. Still listening to hip hop and I am enjoying it and still trying to explain to my mom why hip hop mattered. Right? For my mother, they said, these are folks who are celebrating the worst dimensions of human life. And my response was, well, if we're going to understand hip hop based upon its worst elements, then we have to understand Christianity based on its. Right? If we're going to critique the hip hop artist who says pimpin' ain't easy, then we have to critique the minister whose life pattern suggests pimpin' ain't easy. For me, it, it spoke to a world that was intriguing. There was a kind of push-pull. There was a, a kind of fascination with what hip-hop was telling me. It painted a world that seemed true, authentic, real. That hip-hop seemed to value what takes place within the context of human history when religion, as I understood it, when theism, as I understood it, tried to push beyond human history. It was compelling for me. I was still interested in ministry, but my ministry is taking on a very different look. My role model now was Adam Clayton Powell Jr. because Adam Clayton Powell Jr. argued that his role as a minister was simply an invitation, an opportunity to do some real world work that there were pragmatic reasons for him to be in the church, that it was an easy way to get folks organized. He could get together 5,000 people like that and get them organized around an issue, yeah? That his understanding of the importance of the church, very similar to A. Philip Randolph's understanding of the importance of the church. He's an atheist, but understands that the church becomes an organizing tool. So he paid his dues to the church the way he paid his union dues. This was making some sense to me, but it reached a point where even this didn't work. I had nothing to say that was substantive, that made a difference in the lives of the young people with which I work. They were literally dying. And I didn't have a damn thing to say that altered this. I could make their parents feel better about this death. Right? They're out of this wicked world and now they're with God and everything. I could tell them that, but I had nothing that really transformed life circumstances for these folks. And it reached a point where I had to make a decision. Was I going to be about the business of safeguarding this tradition or did people matter? And I decided people mattered. So I contacted the minister in charge of the church and told him I would no longer be participating. I contacted my bishop and said that I wanted, surrender, I wanted to surrender ordination, that I just could not be involved anymore. And I didn't really think of the consequences. That I had been taught as a small child that you have to stand up for what you believe and the consequences are the consequences. So that didn't really bother me. I had to be true to myself that there were lots of things I was willing to be, but I was not going to be a hypocrite. I wasn't going to stand in the pulpit and preach what I didn't believe. So I had to leave. And I assumed maybe some friends and family wouldn't take too kindly to this, that it really wouldn't be about me, it would be about them, right? That if you don't believe this anymore, what does that say about my faith, you know? So I told my, my mother and I told my siblings and told other folks and my mother's response was, you know, I, I regret this and I hope you come back, but 
You're my son, my blood, and I love you. My siblings, their attitude was this, and this Tony, whatever, you know, <laughs> just, this, this, whatever, just whatever, okay, whatever. Some friends I lost, but that was cool, that was fine. What remained consistent for me, I right? think about it this way, the first 25 years of my life I spent within the context of this theism. So far, I've had another 25 years outside of the context of this theism, but what has remained consistent for me is a deep regard for, appreciation for, yes, even love for hip hop culture. It speaks in ways that are profound, and if you think about it, atheists ought to appreciate, if not love, hip hop. Now, I'm not telling you get rid of your sensible shoes, you can keep them, keep your belts. <laughs> Right? Your T-shirts can fit. Yeah. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm not, even, hell, I'm not even suggesting that you need to go out and buy CDs. I'm saying pay attention to hip-hop. Why? Think about it. There are ways in which atheist and humanist communities represent marginal and despised communities. Hip-hop culture represents a population from its origin that was despised, black and brown bodies in a death-dealing environment. We share a sense of marginality. We also share a sense that wonderful things can happen on the margins, that it's on the margins where we exercise creativity. We understand this, yeah? We share this. Now there's a profound difference. Both of these groups, both of these cultures on the margins, unlikely sources of inspiration and growth, but hip hop has grown in a way that we have not. It's global. I'll give you one example. I co-teach a MOOC, that's a massive open online course. I co-teach it with an artist out of Houston. It's a free course, and we have, in this course, over 50 countries represented in an age range of roughly 13 to 90. It's global. Hip-hop is no longer owned by the United States, hadn't been owned by the United States for quite some time. You want to see folks break dance, Look at the folks in South Korea, Japan. They're doing the damn thing, are they not? Yeah, it's no longer owned by the United States. It is global, a despised population that has captured the popular imagination of nations. They determine how the products you buy are advertised. Snoop Dogg has altered our vocabulary and grammar. <laughs> Laugh, but it's true. I know some of you try to use the terminology. I know you do. It has altered, right? So there are things that hip hop has done well that we might want to learn from. Whether you love the music, love the style, love the DJ or not, there are lessons we can learn from hip hop that might help us improve our own success rate. So I just want to give you a few examples of lessons that we might learn from hip hop, okay? First, the importance of swagger. If you don't know what swagger swagger is, you don't have it. <laughs> it's a certain type of style, a posture towards the world, an understanding that it might be better to be respected than liked. My fear is this, that atheists and humanists still work based, at least implicitly, on the suggestion we ought to be liked. We're here, we're different, but we're okay, like us. It might be better to be respected than liked, to exercise our own form of swag and move through the world based upon that form of swag. I say this in part because being liked hasn't always helped marginal groups. I'll take my own community. African Americans for a long period of time have worked on being liked, have worked on being liked, have worked on being liked, hoping that you would recognize that your humanity is matched by 
our humanity, that your worth is matched by our worth. But I'll share some names with you. Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown. Being liked isn't always enough. It might be better to be respected. Hip-hop culture also raises really interesting questions concerning some of the things that we assume. We make certain assumptions concerning the modern West. We make certain assumptions concerning the Enlightenment. There's something embedded in hip-hop culture that raises questions concerning those assumptions. Reminds us that the Enlightenment, the modern West, has an underbelly. And attached to that underbelly is the dehumanization of African peoples, the destruction of other groups. Yeah, What hip-hop culture encourages us to do is to modify our sense of optimism. To recognize that human progress isn't inevitable. That we are messy, messy creatures. Capable of great good, but history certainly indicates we do a whole lot of crap. And that there might be something about struggle that is worth embracing and celebrating. That we may not be able to determine the outcomes, but we do get to say how we struggle, for what we struggle, and when we struggle. This might be a good way to think about our engagement with theists. Theism is declining in certain regions, but it seems to be on the rise in others. Look at theism's impact on the continent of Africa, South America. At places of population growth, there are still signs that theism matters. And so, being mindful of the fact that struggle has merit, we might want to approach it this way. What do we do to decrease the limit, the kind of harm that theism does? Whether folks remain religious or not, what do we do to limit the kind of impact, negative impact, theism has on life options. And while we're doing that, we might want to turn and look at ourselves and also ask the question, what do we do to limit the kind of harm that atheism or humanism does? You've heard it over and over again over the course of our time together. Simply not believing in gods isn't a prophylactic against stupidity. Right? That you can be a humanist and an atheist and say some ignorant things. I can tell you over the course of my time involved in this movement that I've heard some really ignorant things said with great force and oomph, right? That the key is to limit the kind of harm that we do. That might be a worthwhile goal that we gather from hip hop culture. Also, it becomes important, hip hop culture teaches us this, to develop a language, a grammar, a way of describing and depicting life that is organic. That is us, that is our own. My concern is this, that we've, and I say this as someone who studies religion, as a theologian, that we are too quick to surrender some wonderful terminology to theists. But why can't we talk about ritual, or meaning, or reverence, or awe? Why surrender so quickly this terminology to theists? My concern is this, that there are ways in which this sort of terminology might help us form and forge useful modes of community, give us a way of ritualizing the ordinary and the mundane occurrences of life. There are ways in which hip-hop artists pay better attention to Thoreau than we do. And Walden, you'll remember that Thoreau says, look, you've got to live life deliberately, right? deliberately, so that when you come to the end, you know you have lived. Perhaps we new, need new ways of framing the ordinary, of ritualizing human existence, the web of life within the context of human history, and not so quickly surrender terminology to theists simply because they're loud, they jump up and down and claim it. Maybe we need to hold on to some of this, to recognize the significance of the ordinary, to embrace it, to live through it. Finally, it seems to me that hip-hop culture teaches us that collaboration between unlikely partners is often productive. 
often productive. Russell Simmons, Donald Trump. Unlikely, but they've hooked up and they do work. We might want to think in terms of our own unusual partners. So recognizing then that it might be useful to talk about Richard Wright and Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris and Zora Neale Hurston. If you don't know who they are, I won't tell you. That's part of our growth, right? That is part of our growth. Because hip hop culture tells us that thick diversity is better than superficial or symbolic diversity. Right? It is better than the kind of diversity that doesn't require us to change our agendas and our platforms, to rethink ourselves. It doesn't force us to be uncomfortable as a way of growing. They encourage thick diversity, and we ought to be about that. Finally, hip-hop culture teaches us that there's a poetic quality to life, a poetic quality to life that isn't fully captured in test tubes and laboratories, a poetic quality to life it's important. Science matters, but when you're talking to certain communities like mine, when you begin to talk about science, you also have to be willing to talk about scientific racism, right? So when I think about science, you've got to help me think through Tuskegee. Hip hop provides this sort of complexity. It requires us to recognize again that some wonderful things can come through unlikely co collaborations and cooperations. Whether you go out and buy Jay-Z's CD or not, give some attention to what you can learn from unlikely sources. Thank you. Give it up for Dr. Anthony Penn. Free your mind, the rest will 